All right. Um, I am here today with Bob Murphy. Uh, he is a renowned economist, Austrian economist, um, very prolific, he published a lot of stuff on things from anarcho-capitalism to sort of basic fundamentals of, of Austrian economics, all kinds of stuff, some of which I'll link to in the show notes. Um, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brittany. So I asked you here today because possibly for the first time in my lifetime, anarcho-capitalism is in the news, like in the mainstream <laughs> news. Right. So, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, something to be astounded by in the first place. Um, Javier Millet, I'm probably saying it wrong, um, was elected president in Argentina, and he was running on an anarcho-capitalist platform. Um, we'll talk a little bit about him later on, but I first just wanted to ask you if you could explain to listeners what is anarcho-capitalism? Sure thing. Uh, I, I think Murray Rothbard coined the term, um, and but what it means is that it's the blending, obviously, of anarchism and capitalism. And so the idea is that it's get rid of the state altogether, so hence the anarchism part of it, uh, but also maintain private property. And, and partly the reason for that terminology is to distinguish it because historically – there were other groups who called themselves anarchists and they not only wanted to get rid of the state, but they also thought private property itself was this unnatural hierarchical system that in their view, the state upheld. So to them, capitalism was itself a product of the violent hierarchical state. And if you got rid of all, you know, unjust authority and illegitimate authorities, because you were an anarchist, then you would sweep away capitalism as well. That's what the anarcho socialists thought. And so anarcho-capitalist is designed specifically to clarify that, yes, we favor getting rid of this, the political state, thinking that it's rooted in you know injustice and violation of property rights, but it's because we uphold property rights, not because we think property rights are you know an ex expression of the state. And why is that a good thing? Okay, so there's two main categories of, of trying to get that across. And I know we'll probably flesh these out in more detail as we go through this, but one thing is just in terms of basic principles that uh, from that perspective, the idea is it's unjust to violate someone's property rights or to initiate aggression. That's the standard definition of libertarianism, at least in the American tradition uh, in the wake of Murray Rothbard. And so if that's your principle that you, know, you can't initiate aggression against somebody else, well, then the state by its very nature does that, right? It's not that the state empirically a lot of times happens to do that. It's just, no, by its very nature, if it were a voluntary institution, to put it differently, it wouldn't qualify as a state. And so the two specific attributes of the state that I have in mind are the fact that it engages in taxation and that it claims, a, at least within a certain territory, a monopoly on the determination of the legitimate use of violence, all right, so it's not that the state says we're the only ones who can use violence, but they say the people running it, we can determine when a use of violence is justified or not. So like they could say if someone's breaking into your house, you're allowed to shoot them if they want. So it's not that they're saying only police officers can ever shoot somebody, but the state is saying it's up to us to determine whether you are allowed to do that or not. And if we want to, we can say, no, the rule is you can't do that, like in areas that are, are so-called gun-free zones. Um, and taxation, again, that's qualitatively different from any other kind of payment for a service. That what it means to say you're being taxed for something as opposed to the state provides some, like, like a bridge, and if they charge a toll, that's not really a tax because you don't have to use the bridge or not. Um, but the state doesn't say, hey, anybody who wants to use our military services, here's how much we're going to bill you each month. It's saying, no, we are going to provide these services and we're charging you. And if you don't like it, we'll put you in a cage ultimately. Okay. So that's the sense. So that's, you know, one umbrella is just to say, you can't support such an institution if you, you know, have a certain ethical framework. Uh, and then the other element is just a pragmatic listing and just an analysis of the various things that the state does and to show that um, not only like any legitimate thing a state does could be handled through voluntary means. And so, and on top of that, it's that in practice, when the state tries to accomplish something, even if it's inherently okay, like 
education or building roads, things like that, that aren't intrinsically evil, that still the state does a worse job of it in, in, you know, for standard economic reasons that free market economists can go through. So I've got a whole list of all the whatabouts, all the mm -hmm. objections that always come sure. up. The biggest one I think that people have the most trouble with is um, that you kind of alluded to is protection from crime. And also I'll lump the two together, even though they're a little bit separate and national defense. You know, how do you, how do you, let's say you've got this anarcho-capitalist society going, how do you prevent, you know, not everybody else is anarcho-capitalist. So they've got these aggressive militaries going. How do you prevent one of those militaries from coming in and taking over and, and occupying? Um, and then domestically, how do you, how do you, how do people protect themselves against crime? Okay, sure. And this is, I know you're going to be linking these things, but this, this was the essence of my booklet, Chaos Theory, which was two essays. One was private law and one was private defense for people uh, to, to just know that what I'm going to be saying now is that's where I, I laid a lot of this stuff out. Um, so the private defense, like for, for military invasion, I think that's actually conceptually easier to walk through. And so maybe we'll start with that one. So yeah. and again, the, the logic here is just like you could hear people who are libertarians, again, in the American political context, with a small L at least, uh, might argue against, oh, we don't need political support of schools. You, you, know, you don't need taxpayer funding of schools. You could just have it be done voluntarily. The, the quality will be better. There's more competition. And then, yeah, in the cases if there's poor kids who their either their orphans or their parents really can't afford to send them to school – there'll be philanthropic organization. You know, the community's not going to sit there and let some kids grow up and not know how to read. That's crazy. You know, they'll support them and you don't need effectively the government to stick a gun at everyone's head. And so you better contribute to this thing that we all agree is worthwhile, right? That you don't need to force the community to do something that just 99.9% .9 agree. Yeah, of course we would do that in a civilized world. Okay. So that's kind of the logic. And so, but where even a lot of people who favor privatization of services they think that, okay, yeah, that, that works for things like schools and mail delivery and even building roads. Maybe people can might have some trouble about, well, gee, who would determine the right of way and the traffic lights and where, but the idea that you don't need political officials in charge of hiring guys to lay concrete and stuff. Most people get that. But when it comes to what if there's foreign nations that are amassing armies and they're going to invade us, surely just to let the free market fend that off seems kind of crazy. How would that work? So that's what we, you know, we'll tackle here. So I think the first thing for um, like and what I have in mind is like a, a major city, like a New York or an LA, something like that. And then what if it were anarcho-capitalist? How would it defend itself against in invasion? So I think one thing is uh, you'd start with insurance contracts. And so just like the owners of the skyscrapers would have fire insurance policies, like, hey, what if there's a big war alarm blaze or something? How do what do you do? Well, of course, there'd be insurance to say if the property is damaged from fire, then the insurance company compensates the owners, and then it would be in the interest of the insurance companies to say, okay, for a huge building where you know potentially we might owe billions in compensation, one thing that we'll do is we'll have an, clauses and say, you know, here's what your premium would be if you don't have any standard common sense things that would prevent fire, but it would be astronomical the premiums because the you know the potential liability is so high, and if you know if it's a building that's made up out of uh, lumber and and gasoline that's sprinkled all over the place, you know people yeah. are smoking, they would say yeah if you want us to insure that for fire we're going to charge you a huge premium, and so instead they say however if you build according to these codes and you have a sprinkler system and you have contractual arrangement with the local voluntary, you know, private sector fire departments and blah, blah, blah. And you go through all these things that would, you know, prevent a fire from occurring and then quickly suppress it in case it start, you know, up to with the latest industry, you know, uh, cutting edge standards of in, in the industry, then we can afford to charge you a much lower premium for this coverage because we, as the insurance company know, okay, now the chance of there being a billion dollar claim from this building is a lot lower because look at all these procedures and we would have the right to like send in inspectors and check your sprinklers or what, you know, spot checks. We're not going to announce it. We're just going to show up, you know, and, and have you walk us through and we'll see what the fire extinguishers are located and they're full, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the smoke alarms are, are working. So 
you know, that's kind of the model. So that's the idea. And I think most people can follow what I said there. And so I just notice I'm saying you, that's why you don't need the mayor's office to come up with building codes and to have a, you know, fire up like mm -hmm. that stuff's all volunteer. Like, and in fact, you would expect that to be better in the long run than if it was a political process determining those fire codes and things. Cause it's, you know, the politicians, it's not their money on the line. Whereas you'd expect the insurance company to really be on top of the latest innovations and studying, you know, the, the right. experience of, of their competitors in other cities and things. Yeah. Okay. So then just, take it one step further another possible bad thing that could happen to your skyscraper is a foreign army might you know send its air force over and drop bombs on it and so maybe you'd want to have insurance against that kind of contingency and so it'd be a similar process and again you're paying premiums but now here the insurance company is going to have to you know when they're going to cover you and and say how much would we charge in a premium they would have to say well what's the chance that this event is going to happen and it's a lot lower if we have uh, you know surface to air missile sites set up and if there's we have our own air force and whatever that can repel invasion and we have radar stations and blah 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 and we have intelligence networks that scour the globe to give us early warning about oh this these people over here are massing troops and their politicians are saying that you know we're sitting on their historical land and they're trying to get their people ginned up to be okay with them conquering us and blah 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 that, you know, that's the kind of information that the, so it'd be in the insurance in this model. And this is just one idea I think right. it would play out like this, but again, it's, if it's a free society, they might come up with a better idea, but this could work is so it would be when you say like, well, who would fund, you know, national defense or city defense in this example, if it's just a big giant city, uh, it would be the insurance companies would be the direct payers. And so the, the system is like, the, the broad property owners would be paying premiums to their insurance companies defending or compensating them in the possibility of a invasion and, or, you know, military damage, whatever. So, and then just, it would be the if, companies hiring it. Yep. So you might be about to go onto this tangent, but I think a, a mm -hmm. question that'll come up for people is, well, then what's to prevent those insurance companies or whoever it is that's setting up the, the surface to air missiles and all that, what's to prevent them from becoming an aggressive imperialist type military? Okay, Gr yeah, great question. So here, um, and, and this, this is gonna bleed into, you know, the other big thing about private law, how could that work? So if you just, for the moment, and again, we'll come back to this and explore it, but if we just stipulate for the sake of argument that there is a law, you know, there's law and order, there's the rule of law in this society right now. And then we're just saying, if that could be possible, suspend your disbelief for the moment. How could these people, these free people defend themselves from a foreign invasion? You know, that that's what we're answering right now. So the, the answer is like all these insurance companies. So for one thing, they would not be themselves maintaining the SAM sites and the tanks and troops and snipers and blah, blah, blah. I think they would just be buying those services, right? So I think there'd be competition. So it wouldn't be one company that would own all of the military hardware. Um, there would be competition just like, you know, in any private industry right now that's not propped up by government uh, regulations, there's even in industries where there's like one giant player, there's typically one competitor, right? That kind of keeps them honest. And, you know, that phrase is metaphorical, but or also at least literally. the threat of competition, at least they know that they can't go too right. crazy or someone will come in and. Right. Right. And so that's, you know, that that's what happens. So there still would be the, the rule of law. Again, they're there's not taxing them. They're not allowed to take money from anybody. And, um, and, and so that, I mean, that's the, the, the quick answer. And even by the way, just to show what, what I mean. So right now it's standard. Like if, um, you know, if troops are invading your country, you might do things like blow up the bridges and, uh, you know, do things to try to like slow their advance. So in the kind of world I'm talking about in the framework, even if certain let me say one thing just so people finish the, the train of thought. So how would the insurance company figure out how to price these services, like to know what they're worth? Again, it would just go back to, they might say, okay, so, uh, um, you know, we have policies that we've provided coverage in all these major skyscrapers in this region, or, or some of them at least, and maybe there's competitors that have done other ones. And maybe we'll pay bounties so that, you know, our actuaries run the numbers. And we say, given that there might be an invasion, if they're sending, uh, air, you know, air force sorties over us and a given 
company that's operating certain SAM sites, for every bomber you knock out, we will give you $800,000 or, you know, but I'm making that number up, but yeah, the number wouldn't be arbitrary. They would, you know, they would do a cost benefit and just see how much would that be sparing us in expected payouts on the margin. And that's how there would be some rationality there. And so that's, that would help guide the defense effort. Whereas right now, you know, if the government's in charge, you've got a bunch of guys and maybe they went to West Point or something and they served in Iraq or whatever, but it's, you know, a bunch of central planners basically saying, we have all these resources at our disposal. What's the best way to use them to stop an invasion? And why would we expect them to be able to do that? If you're familiar with, you know, the general critique of economic planning, then it's the same logic here. So here mm -hmm. I'm saying there's genuine market prices where the insurance companies can come up with and say, you know, knocking out one bomber is worth 800,000, taking out a hundred infantry is worth blah, blah, blah. And then depending, you know, so that could help guide the efforts. Well, and not only that, but in the model you're talking about, you know, these guys, whoever's making these, these pricing decisions, they stand to go out of business if they get it wrong. Whereas in the system we have currently, the military planners, they're not going to go out of business. I mean, the worst that might happen is maybe somebody will lose their position, but that enterprise, if you want to call it an enterprise, it's going to keep going. There's, there's, there's no threat of, you know, bankruptcy for, the military industrial complex. So I think that's kind of another. But, right. I mean, if you're, if we're talking about like being invaded, I guess you could say the ultimate downside would be if you screw it up, you get taken over by a foreign yeah, power. Yeah, there's that. Uh, and, and one little asterisk on that. So also, cause I have some people, you know, objected to what I was saying and, and they were like, well, what's the point of being compensated if some enemy came in and took over your area? But again, if we're talking about people who own skyscrapers, like they would have the ability, they might leave the vicinity and still have international bank accounts. And, and the, you know what I mean? So it's, it's even if one city gets devastated, the fact that you had insurance policies with these major co corporations that have a global footprint, you know, they would still owe you the money contractually and all that kind of stuff. So there's mm -hmm. that. But, but just to quickly finish the, the point I was making before. So in this framework where there's still the rule of law and property rights, if the insurance companies either themselves or they delegate it, you know, to some other company, uh, you know, some other company might be have its, uh, maybe they have sharpshooters all over the place. And like, that's what they specialize in is they have a sniper force and they take out infantry and they have a, you know, a, a schedule of, of compensation where, you know, Oh, you take out a general, you get such and such, you take out a corporal, you get blah, blah, blah. If you plant explosives and take out one of their tanks, this is how much you get. And maybe they would find, that they could increase their profits by blowing up key bridges and stuff to slow the enemy advance so they can get their snipers all positioned to then start taking people out or whatever. They couldn't just do that without cost. They would have to yeah. compensate the domestic, you know, their, their neighbors who own the bridge. So they could still do it. Like they wouldn't be brought up on criminal charges in, in this system. I think people would, you know, recognize the courts would recognize that. Okay. Yeah. You did that because of the situation. Just like if somebody is starving in the woods and breaks into a cabin and eats their food they don't just get to do that for no, with no consequences, but they're not going to be charged the same way like a regular home invader would be charged. So people yeah. would recognize what was going on. So likewise here. And again, that doesn't hamstring the defense effort. That That's what makes it more effective. You don't want the army thinking it can just go around blowing up your neighbor, you know, its own yeah. people's property <clears throat> because, well, in our opinion, this helps the war effort. Like you don't know that. And so market prices keep you honest and make sure that the efforts are coordinated. Maybe, no, this bridge is really essential for evacuating civilians too. And if you take it out, yeah, it slows the enemy advance, but then it means more people get trapped in their side and get captured or killed or, so, you know, that kind of stuff. So yeah. ultimately, and if, if normal people had policies too, that would compensate them in the event that, you know, if you had a life insurance that also paid off in the event of a military invasion, you know, those insurance companies would have something to say. And again, so it's all these different right. competing interests when you're trying to determine like to repel an, an invasion. Like one thing you could do is, oh, let the troops come in and then just drop a nuclear bomb and wipe out the invading army. You kill half your population too, but hey, the, the, so clearly it's not repel the enemy with no other considerations or criteria. That's not what they're tasked with. And I'm saying- market prices that try to make people feel the incentives and realize these are all the competing interests at play. That's how in other arenas we allow for social, you know, rational coordination of activity. And you could bring that to bear even on something like military defense that most people think 
well, that has nothing to do with the market economy. And, you know, there's a sense in, right, but the the defense does. Like, yeah, what the invading army's doing, that's not free market, that's not voluntary, but organ, it, in other words, it's not that all of a sudden coercion is great when it comes to organizing your defense activities. But for the same reason yeah. that if you want to feed your people, you don't have the government in charge of wheat output. You let the market figure that out and which, you know, farmland should be devoted to what and blah, blah, blah. And truckers bringing food to the grocery stores and how many grocery stores should they be and where should they be located? Those are all things we leave up to the market and that feeds our people way better than centrally planning it. Yeah. And likewise, yeah, defending us from a military invasion is important, just like food is important. And so the best way to take our given resources and knowledge and come up with the most potent, efficient defense is to let market forces help, you know, coordinate things. Yeah. And just to clarify, I don't think you're saying you were talking about, you know, if they blew up a bridge, they wouldn't necessarily be tried on, you know, they wouldn't be brought up against on criminal charges. I don't think you're saying they would be above the law that they that there's nothing these companies could do that that would have them tried as criminals. Is that right? Oh, correct. Right. So, yeah, they like they couldn't if they went out at gunpoint and rounded up a thousand people and conscripted them and said, you're fighting now for the resistance or else we're going to shoot you. Yeah, I, I don't, th I think they would, if they did that, they would be charged with kidnapping. You know, they would, the right. they're, they're still say, held to the yeah. same laws that right. everyone else is, right? They're still, right. there's not a special standard for them. Right, right. That That's what I was saying. Yeah. So what I was trying to get at with, you know, with the, in the woods, when you break yeah. into someone's cabin because you're Yeah, starving. it's a special circumstance. That's different from like, you know, teenage kids are just bored and they see these things. Hey, let's break in there and see if there's anything good in there. They yeah. would be charged differently, but still, even the person who breaks in just because he's starving, when he's back on his feet and back in society, has to you know compensate the person for the food he took. Yeah, so I'm saying likewise. Yeah, if you blow up a bridge for strategic reasons to slow the enemy invasion, you still have to pay the owner's compensation. But yeah, you probably would not be charged in that instance with crime. You would just be charged with property damage. Okay, so I've got a couple more specific questions about the defense thing, but I think this might be a good place to start talking about the rule of law. And sure. how would that happen if you don't have a monopoly state, if you don't have some authority dictating, you know, what the law is and how it's enforced? How do you how do you get that? Great. Yep. So so here I I want to kind of like shake people out of because you because you're right, there's this like um if you think about it in a certain way, it seems like it's an impossible problem that like, okay, yeah, the rule of law and property rights and even the military defense, yeah, given that we know, but if we don't, you know, don't we need to have an agency that defines the property rights just to even start before then the free market can get going? Like, how could you have the market define property rights if that's one way of thinking about it? Because don't you need to know who owns what in the first place? So I, I get that issue. And, and I think that a lot of objectivists, you know, like people following the tradition of Ayn Rand, that's how they come to this. And that's why they conclude anarchism, even the anarcho-capitalist variant of it, doesn't make any sense. And and so, uh, but I think there's a logical fallacy in that way of thinking. So let me just warm people up. I think we'd all agree there's definitely, you know, rules of grammar and, and uh, spelling and punctuation and things like when it comes to the English language. Right. It's not that English is arbitrary. There's definitely rules of grammar. There's certain sentences we can all say, yep, that's grammatical or that isn't grammatical. And then we say, OK, so who's in charge of the English language? What group of experts or authority figures dictates to the, everybody else what the rules of grammar are? And there is no such group of people. Now, there's things like dictionaries and grammar books and style guides. But what those are doing are just codifying what the community's usage shows are the actual rules, right? That if if the Oxford English Dictionary came out and said the word up, you know, UP, if that means moving towards the ground, and that's how it defined it in a certain edition, it's not that we would all say, oh, I guess that's what up means. We would just say, no, that's wrong. That's not the definition of up. And if they did do that, and they, especially if they consistently did that, they would go out of business. People would stop buying the Oxford English Dictionary because they would say its definitions are wrong. Right. So again, so it's not that the people publishing the Oxford Dictionary define words. What they do is they codify, they distill down for public reference what the definitions are. And it's not that they made that decision. Okay. So that's what I think 
the law is, right? It's this um, organic thing, <laughs> for lack of a better term right now, that, uh, you know, governs human interaction and that what happens when two parties are having a dispute. And by the way, what I'm saying here, this is this isn't just me inventing this. This is coming from reading people talking about like how the common law emerged and how, you know, law came, you know, from you know, Rome and then through England and whatever to, to come over here to the United States. So that's what I'm just taking that and then kind of elaborating upon or extending it. But the idea is that, you know, when people have a dispute, they, they can't, you know, someone says, Oh, he stole my television set. And the guy says, no, I didn't that, you know, how do you resolve that? And so they can go to a, a judge and just present their case. And the judge gives the interpretation, gives the opinion. We even use that term opinion. Mm, yeah. so it's not that the judge is making the law. The judge is saying, in my opinion, we have this antecedent body of law and that's how it applies in this situation. And, you know, and nowadays in the modern context with the state being so uh, omnipresent in all of our activities, a lot of people think, you know, from what I just said, like, okay, fine. But the law that the judge is applying is just what a bunch of legislators said. And I'm saying that's a relatively recent uh bit of hubris in terms of humanity that historically no the law was just this thing independent of you know human uh, right I, th I think that's an important i think mm -hmm. that's an important distinction to make between common law and administrative law i mean i don't know at what point we started having these these you know professionals who sat in rooms making up laws for everybody but my understanding of the history of, of common law is it's it's as you say it's you know, it's sort of the collection of people's experience in resolving disputes. But then this other thing came in where it's like these guys sitting in these rooms saying, okay, what laws are we going to come up with, you know, this year and, you know, impose on these people, whether they, you know, want them or not. I think there's, there's, there's a qualitative distinction between those two kinds of law. Exactly. So for your listeners who are familiar, uh, Friedrich Hayek has a collection called Law, Legislation and Liberty. And if it's so there, he's making the distinction between the law and legislation that's not redundant. And, and the, those are the terms that he yeah. used to say, you know, law means things like, you know, you can't kill people, blah, blah, blah. Whereas legislation, he meant things that political officials get together and they explicitly uh, formulate and, and just say, you yeah. know, but issue by fiat. And that's what legislation is. So he was saying, no, the law is ancient that you know, way back in the day, even if there was like kings or tribal elders or whatever, they would apply the law. Like they knew stealing is illegal. Murder is illegal. And if you said why, they wouldn't have said, well, because I'm the king and I said so. They would just say, Speak because it is. You know, maybe they would say the gods gave it or, if, you know, under monotheism, you'd say it came from God or whatever. Or later they might say natural law. But the idea, you know, being that, no, murder really is illegal. Just like two plus two is four, not because some mathematician said so. It, it is like a mathematician can grasp it and study it and maybe try to explain it to you, but it's not because the mathematician said so it is supposed to is for just like murder is illegal, whether or not some political officials say, if they say it isn't, then they're wrong, you know, in that, in that conception. And, and so you're right. I don't remember. I mean, I, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would have given you a better answer, but it's been a while since I've read some of those material, but yeah, at some point in the, in like Europe, it did evolve away from just, you know, the king and, you know, his uh, subordinates administering the common law and, you know, judges making rulings because they just thought there was this pre-existing antecedent body of law that we're just the ministers of or the enforcers of into more of a, this is, these are the rules because we said so. Yeah. And that was, yeah. it was somewhat of a gradual, I think it would start in certain cases and then, you know, expanded. Um, and also like a huge shift, just as an aside, was um, that crime came to be, you didn't commit a crime against the direct victim, you committed right. it against the state. And that's why like right. if you're charged in the United States, it's like the people of New York state versus the defendant. It's yeah. not the, you know, the people who had deposits at the bank that got stolen you know, you think, well, shouldn't they be the ones or, the, yeah. you know, you kill somebody. It's not that guy's a state bringing a, cl a, a criminal case against you. Maybe it's a civil case, but no, it's the people yeah. of New York versus blah, blah, which 
again, it's just the, the government, you know, sticking its nose in and saying, oh, you have, is a front to us, you know, which anyway. Right. So, so how would this, so we're kind we're talking about common law here. We're not really, we're not talking about administrative law. How in a, in a society without a monopoly on force or a monopoly on the judicial system, how would that even happen? How, how would, I guess the big question is how, you know, in a nuts and bolts sense, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, it's easy to imagine how there could, how there could be, you know, judges and courts of law that are competing, that are independent, but when it comes to enforcement, when it comes to actually, okay, this guy is guilty of murder. There's some penalty for that. How does that get enforced in a world where there's no monopoly on force? Okay, sure. If, if I could just take a second just to say a little bit more, just to make sure we're not you know, leaving yeah. people too skeptical. Yeah. So I alluded to it like with math, but you know, math and science, there's all kinds of fields of human enterprise where there's definite objective conclusions or results, things people believe in, and yet they're not promulgated by some authority figure, right? Again, with, with math, yeah. nobody's in charge of math. Now there's per certain experts and things, but again, uh, you know, and it, on any given thing, if like some guy solves some theorem that was took, you know, decades of an unsolved famous math problem and some guy solves it, the average person in the public, I mean, they might not even care, but even if they do care, they're not in a position, they couldn't read the proof and say, oh yeah, that checks out, good job. Yeah, They have to rely on other math. But the idea is you kind of trust there's enough of independence and competition and rivalry and objectivity in this field that if a bunch of the experts all sign off and say, yep, that's a valid proof, this guy finally did it, you know, Firma said this on his deathbed and this guy finally proved it, That that's probably accurate, right? Even though... You know, nobody's in charge of that. There's anarchy in math. And yet, yeah, no, it's actually very hierarchical. There's respected journals and whatever. And so I'm saying likewise with the law, there would be, you know, different authority figures, you know, experts who would be publishing codes and things and saying like, th this is the way in terms of property theft or property law, you know, th this is the, the procedures that would be used and this is homicide and da, 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 and all kinds of, you know, different areas of the law where there'd be experts writing things. But again, it wouldn't be they would just say because I said so. They would have reasoning and whatever, and they would be trying to. And the reason they would become and rise from the through the ranks among their peers as being a recognized authority is because the people who are experts in that would agree that oh yeah, that person, the thing he wrote three years ago is the definitive work on home invasion. And so if you're ever a judge, you know I I totally like a judge who takes that as the framework and then applies that to the particular facts of the case. To me, that's a really fair, just ruling, right? That's the idea. Um, and then also, if people are familiar with modern day arbitration, that's how I think it would yeah. work as well. So people have a dispute and, you know, it's, it's most people think they're, or they say they're right. You know, I think it's, it's, and we can deal in a minute, uh, Brittany with, you know, cases of like, what if, you know, someone really is just a bad actor and whatever, but in yeah. general, when people have a dispute, it, you know, there's they're, it's self-serving bias and whatever, but they, they, they're not up there saying, well, I have more guns. And so that's why. I'm right. It's more, they, they will come up with self-serving arguments. And then the issue is, well, how do we adjudicate among those claims? And so for them to, I, I would say we, we, in a typical dispute, like each side would say, I'm willing to submit our disagreement, you know, to a third party here and abide by the decisions, by, by, by the you know opinion that this third party gives. And, and right now in the real world, that's kind of how arbitration works. Yeah. And so how would those people get a clientele by having a reputation for fairness. Like, so it couldn't be in a divorce yeah. proceeding. One judge is always pro wife or is always pro husband because then when a couple is having a dispute, at least one of them would object and say, no, we're not going to that guy because you know, he's always biased against, you know, my side of the, so you would, you know, the only way a judge could stay in business is if he or she has a reputation for being very fair and just applying the law yeah. dispassionately and so I'm saying that's, you know, that's how that would arise. So now just to come back to your um, question about, okay, enforcement. So here I disagree with a lot of the literature. I don't know if it's a disagreement, but if you go read some of the classic works in anarcho-capitalism, like Murray Rothbard's um, stuff, uh, like For a New Liberty is, I think, one of his earliest works where he has a chapter on this and then he's written other stuff. They tend to co collapse it into, oh, the there's like a defense agency that 
both has like internal people who make the ruling and they also have burly guys on the payroll who have guns and then they go and, and I don't think that's how it would play out. I think they would be distinct entities in a free society where one, you know, the, the judge is just a person. I mean, it would have support staff and whatever, but I think the judge would be just like, in, you know, a solo person, or maybe there'd be a company that has a team of judges that, you know, oh, anytime someone has a dispute like this and they get referred to us, we figure out whose schedule can, you know, who can hear this case, you know, quick, listen, quick most quickly and boom, there you go. But I think, you know, that would be one, just like right now, law firms don't also have on this payroll um, s- security personnel, right? Like the, the local mall might have security, that, like mall cops, you know what I mean? Like yeah. uh, not, not actual police officers. And I'm just saying in practice, law firms don't also run those services out of the same company. You know I mean, those are just totally right. different things. And so right. I think that's how it would be in a, in a free society where there wouldn't be government provided police. What would happen is, um, you know, so I think the guy down the street stole my television set. I, I say that, you know, he, and we go and I say, Hey, I'm willing. And I list like the top 10 in the community, either uh, judicial firms or individuals who specialize in property theft, property crime, and say, I'm willing to submit our case to any one of those 10 you pick. And the guy said, no, 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 they're all crooks. I don't trust those guys here. Wh- what about this guy? It's his brother-in-law who no one's ever heard of. Let, I'll, let's take our case to him. The community is going to quickly recognize that, you know, I'm yeah. in, probably in the right. And so then I still go and take the case. And so I go and, con- and you know, there's agencies like Property Retrieval Inc. And, you know, yeah. and, and I contact them. I say, hey, this guy stole my TV. I need you to go. I, it's st- in his house. Like I looked in and I see he's watching stuff with my TV. And and then I, so I tell them and they're going to say, well, we need to maintain our good standing in the community. We're not just going to go to this guy's house and break in and take his TV. We need a court order. You know, you, you, you show mm-hmm. us a reputable judge who has ruled that in his opinion, that is your TV. And then we'll go do it. And so then I take my case and it gets tried in absentia. If that guy refuses to show up, I show, mm-hmm. you know, my receipt my my uh footage from the night it was stolen and it's someone walking out that looks kind of like him and, and i give all the circumstance and i you know that de- trying to demonstrate it's his and let's say i have enough evidence that the judge is comfortable saying yes in my opinion he is guilty of stealing your tv and among other things he should return the television set and you know two ounces of gold for your time and trouble and blah 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 so th- that right there the judge you know he's not he doesn't have an army at his disposal. Right. He doesn't press a button. That's just his ruling. And now the separate agency who has a reputation in the community, the community trusts these guys. They're not worried about them being rogue criminals because, yeah. oh no, we only will step onto someone's property against their will if we have a valid, you know, or opinion from a, a respected legal authority because it's in their business interest to maintain the trust of the community that they're themselves not a bunch of thieves. Right. They right. show up again. Are they going to kick the guy's door in and shoot up a plate, you know, throwing flashbang grenades and end up killing the guy's infant? Of course not. That would be terrible for business. No one would ever go to yeah. them again if they did that. Yeah. And so instead, you know, they'll wait for the, till when the guy's out of the house and they'll go in and retrieve the TV that way or something, you know, or yeah. first, obviously they'll send notices saying, Hey, we've got this pending thing. You've got 60 days to comply. And then if it doesn't, you know, then so I'm just saying that's the way I think the system would play out. So you could just see it each step. So yeah. as long as there's competition and you notice, you know, it's in everybody's interest in a civilized society. Reputable companies are not going to want to even have the appearance that they're engaging in criminal activity because that's just bad for business. Right. And presumably, it, let's say a company did do something like that, broke into someone's, broke down someone's door, killed family members, killed their dog, whatever. That person could then take legal action against them in a way that you really can't against the police. Is Am I right about that? Y- yes. Right. But they would be they would be held accountable for any for their own criminal activities. They wouldn't have this, you know, special status, um, you know, qualified immunity or any other special status that you get just by virtue of being part of that monopoly. Yeah, right. So I so yes, the the, the quick answer is I agree with you wholeheartedly. There wouldn't be immunity and oh, just because you're in the act of law enforcement, that means all bets are off and you can do whatever you want and Oh, I feared for my life, and that's why I shot that dog. I mean, there there could be things where if it, you know the carrying out of your standard duties, if certain things happen, just like 
you know, you can come up with crazy scenarios. Let's say the house is on fire and the, you know, the, the, the private company that has firefighters on the payroll and they go there and someone, you know, takes the hose out and sprays it in there. And what if there was someone that they didn't realize and he was trying to climb out the window and the water smacks him in the face and kills him, you know, they, they presumably would be treated more leniently than if some people, you know, it was a mob hit and they went up and said, okay, well, we're going to kill this guy's get this high powered hose and just drown him." You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so like, yeah. obviously the intention, <clears throat> blah, blah, blah matter, but, but right. It's not that simply because you're enforcing uh, property uh, rights that therefore you can do whatever you want. And the law doesn't apply to you that, that no, the law would apply to every, that's again, the whole point. There's yeah. no privileged group in this system that yeah. is above the law. Everyone is subject to the law. So here you really do have the rule of law. It's what's ironic about this. That like the right. objectivists and whatever say, oh no, we we uphold the rule of law. It's so special to us. We can't bear a system of anarchy where there's no rule of law. It's just you know whatever is profitable. And I would say no, it's it's in your it's only in this decentralized system I'm talking about that the rule of law does get applied to everyone equally. Just like yeah. right now, if the president says something ungrammatical, and that happens a lot <laughs> with Joe Biden. We can all say he just said something ungrammatical. It's not that, oh no, by definition, whatever the president says is defines what grammatical uses, right? Right. So the rules of grammar apply to everyone. And likewise, property rights, you know, the rule of title transfer and with the rule of what, you know, what constitutes a crime and blah, blah. Those rules apply to everyone in the system, even the people who are, you know, whose job it is to enforce those rules. Yeah. That does seem to be sort of a fundamental misconception, I think or I, I look at it almost as um, kind of magical thinking about the state, like somehow without really thinking through how this happens, somehow there's this belief that you can get rule of law and you can get like genuine rule of law mm -hmm. in a system where there's a monopoly. And I think when you look closely, you kind of see what you've just described, which is, well, no, you get this special privileged space for the people who are part of the monopoly and the rules are different for them and everyone else you know maybe there's rule of law maybe there's not but there's this distinction between everyone else and the people in the, in the monopoly and i feel like that's kind of one of the biggest barriers to break through because it, it, in my view it does kind of just boil down to this like just belief like a faith-based belief in this monopoly system but the the opposite is actually true right and at a certain level of abstraction you know it, it could be true or not true in either system right so right now i can imagine people listening to us objecting and saying what are you talking about biden can't do whatever he wants right now trump is being tried for blah 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 you know so we're showing the president's not above the law <laughs> you know, and you know the police if they you know what's his name um was a Chauvin? Yeah, you know, he got yeah. convicted. You know, so the police right. just can't go around killing. We talk. What's talking about? It's a, so yeah. At a certain level of abstraction, yep. There's the rule of law in that system, and then it's a matter of, um, I would say just okay. Using your analysis, just say in practice, which system is more likely to actually have the reality line up with the spirit of what you know the, the defender of the system hopes would happen. So just like we can kind of say, you know, in practice. We think that, yeah, they're even though on paper, the people in the government aren't above the law, you know, I think you and I, Brett, you still think, that, yeah, the people in the CIA are are not <laughs> subject to the same laws as ever, everybody else. Right. But they get away with a lot of stuff that if you or I did, it would be criminal. Yeah. And rightly so. Yeah. Uh, and and so, most and, yeah. and police all the time, you know, there might mm -hmm. be a few isolated cases, you know, that's kind of, you know, that prove the rule. But, you know, you do see crazy things happening at the hands of police. It's like, no, if, if an ordinary human being did that, they'd be in jail. Right, um, right. Yeah, yeah. And and so, yeah. And so in, the, in this system, too, that, again, with the anarcho-capitalist sketch of that world that I just gave on paper, like I'm telling you in my story, oh, it works out well. And then, yeah, you can imagine, and maybe this is, you know, some of the objections you want to get into about Okay, but yeah, what if there's like major w wealthy individuals aren't they going to be able to buy verdicts and things? So theoretically, that could happen. And then if you if we want to get into at some point, you know, talking about why I think the checks and balances would be better in that system than in the first one, 
uh, we yeah, let's it, let's talk a little bit about checks and balances. So that's a good example. Um, and also, like, you know, what happens when you do have like a gen genuine bad actors, like, you know, people who who have no interest, who, so what you're describing is, is a system where people really, everyone has an interest in maintaining their reputation in society. Um, but what about people who don't care? What about people who just, you know, want to go around and kill people or, you know, wreak havoc or whatever? How does, how does it work with people like that? Okay, sure. So maybe we'll do like the crazy axe murder first, and then do like the rich guy, and then the witch, yeah, commits crimes and just pays judges, and then the rich okay. axe murderers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, um, yeah. What was that movie? You, you know, the eighties movie with the serial, or the movie about the guy in the eighties, the serial killer, uh, the guy who played Bat Christian Bale. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't watch enough movies. Okay. Well, no, anyway, it's, but... I can't believe it's not, but anyways, there's certain, it's a, it's a cult classic. So some of your listeners, okay. I'm sure are like, oh yeah, I can't believe Bob can't is, is blanking on the name, but anyway, it was a, a wall street executive guy who also happened to be a serial killer. And it was, Oh, yeah. American psycho. Yes. Was that? Yes. Okay. 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 So, um, yeah. So, and you're right that a lot of what I said I was appealing to incentives that ultimately came down to like, yeah, your goodwill in the community, things like that. So I think partly what would happen is um, it, again, at least in Western societies, like how things would play out if it was like a, a relatively poor Muslim community might look a lot different, but I'm talking here about a fairly secular, but based on a Judeo Christian heritage capitalist society that just goes full and cap. And I think the way that would play out is, people would get um, either fraternal organizations or just literal insurance companies would effectively be vouching for you. And so just like right now, uh, like a, like a brain surgeon has malpractice insurance. Yeah. And so what does that say that if, if it's demonstrated, not just that, you know, something went wrong and, but that no, if he did something that really was not medically appropriate and blah, 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 and that, you know, he's on the hook, but he has insurance to cover that. Okay. And so I think just generalizing that idea or just with auto insurance, like right now, if you kill somebody or you, you know, mess up somebody's car, your insurance pays for it directly. Yeah. Right. Even if, if you're at fault. And so likewise, I think just generalizing that concept, that I think people would have standard policies or at least in certain areas, like particularly in big cities where there's a lot of anonymity and people don't you know, know who's who, because it's, it's a big community and you're seeing a lot of strangers day in and day out. I think there probably would be a role for, insurance policies like that. So um, like before a uh, an apartment complex would rent you a, you know, give you a lease for a, a year or something besides running your credit and there's, you know, there still would be credit rating agencies, you know, in this kind of a world, they would also like, you'd have a standard policy that if you're convicted right. in a reputable, you know, court system, and this would all be specified in the contract, like what does it mean to say a reputable, you know, that, uh, yeah, you know, whatever. If it's just convicted that you did a bunch of damage or like you assaulted another resident in the property and blah, blah, that, and it's, if you owe us damages that you have a policy that covers that. So we know we're good. Right. And so, mm -hmm. so there, and then maybe, you know, you got, and, and it's just like with your auto insurance, if you're constantly causing accidents, your rates go up. So likewise yeah. here, if you're constantly getting, convicted of like beating people up or, you know, petty theft or whatever, vandalizing the building and your insurance company keeps covering for that and, and, and making everybody whole, it's going to be harder for you to maintain coverage, or at least your premiums are going to go way up. So that's partly, you know, to get you to feel the consequences of what you're doing. Um, so, but, you know, so those kind of mechanisms I think would, would, would work for 98% of the population and just give people incentives to keep their behavior in line. Again, it's not going to be perfect, but right now in the real world, people commit crimes all the time. It's not the threat of the state finding you, convicting you and putting you in, in a cage with some other unsavory people. That's yeah. not eliminating crime at all. Right. So it's just a matter of which system we're, but so now we just focus. Okay. Yeah. But the crazy ax murder, serial killer, what have you, it's not that he wakes up and says, I could go, you know, chop off 10 people's heads today but gee, my insurance rates might go up. Maybe I won't do that. Like, that's not what's going on with a guy like that. Okay. Yeah. So he does it. And so at the very least, among other things you could possibly say, I want to say, keep in mind in an ANCAP world, every piece of property, every bit of land is privately owned. 
Like some of it might be right. owned by a corporation or so, you know, it might not be that, oh, Jim owns that. It might be, you know, a, a, an entity that has shareholders and whatever, but still there's no such thing as private property. There's not like there's the public sidewalk that, Hey, I have a right to be here like anybody else. No, everything's privately owned and you can set whatever rules you want as far yeah. as who's allowed on my property. So I think in crazy cases like that, where the guy's on video camera, he just walks into a crowd and just starts, you know, just take out a samurai sword and starts killing people. And, you know, they go to 10 different judges who all review the footage and they make sure they identify the guy and he has no alibi or he doesn't show up. And it's well understood that, yes, this individual is a convicted serial killer or, you know, mass murderer. At the very least, every property owner in the area is going to say, you are not allowed on our property. And so wherever that guy mm -hmm. finds himself, besides if he, you know, if he owned his own house or something, the people will be able to call you know, the local security agencies to say, get this guy off my property. Right. So you don't, I don't need to have a separate theory of under what circumstances is it legitimate for us to physically grab someone and drive him somewhere and put him in a cage. I'm saying everybody can say, get off my land. And I think in that framework, there would emerge a role for uh, institutions that would be like sanctuaries for people like that. And so hmm. it could be religiously motivated or it could just be a business that says, hey, at any given time in this, you know, society, this big city of 10 million people, there's 800 people at any given time that are pariahs because they're, they're like serious criminals and no one wants them on their property. So, hey, if you're such a person, come here. We're going to pat you down and make sure you don't have any weapons on you. We're going to put you in a, you know, a very monitored cell and blah, blah, blah. You're going to sign paperwork coming in that says you agree you know, that you can't come and go as you please. And you're, you know, you're agreed to a bunch of stuff, but on the other hand, we're not going to treat you sadistically. Uh, you have the right to, you know, transfer to a different one of our competitors. That's part of the clause. And, you know, you have open lines of communication with our competitors. If you feel you're being mistreated once you're in here that, you know, they can send their representatives and say, do you want to come over here? So there'd be, so it would be like the prisons in this world would actually be like hotels huh. competing for the patronage of these people. Yeah. But yet they wouldn't, it would be like the hotel California, right? <laughs> that once you go in, you just can't, you can't leave the system. Um, and the only way you would get out that is if one of those agencies again, like would vouch for you at some point. So if right. you really are rehabilitated and, you, and they, and notice, you know, what, what's the incentive for all this, just pure profit motive. People yeah. are not as productive if they're sitting in a cell somewhere. And, and by the way, if the person could work from within this, the, that facility, that institution, they would, they wouldn't have them doing something stupid, like, breaking rocks or making license plates. That's not productive. Yeah. If the guy was an accountant. They would try to come up with a way. Can he do his accountant work from in here? Because right now he's got an $800,000 or it'd be in gold ounces or Bitcoin or yeah. something <laughs> amount. He owes the, the estates of the people he killed and he's got to work that debt off. Yeah. You, you know? And yeah. so he's not going to do that. Breaking I, rocks. Also, I also wonder what would happen. You know, let's say again, there, there's somebody where it's on the record. It's clear. This person murdered a bunch of people or murdered one person. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder what, what would happen in a situation like that where it is absolutely clear and the family of one of the people that he killed just goes and takes the guy out. You know, what would the legal consequences be to them? What, you know, mm -hmm. in, in our current world, they would be in trouble, but would they necessarily in, in, in Kapistan? Okay, yeah, great question. So quick answers, I'm not sure. Because I yeah. I can't centrally plan the law. Just like if you asked me how many grocery yeah. stores per capita would there be, I don't know. That's you'd let market forces determine that. So my guess is that uh, I think what would happen is um, that there would yeah there would be a, a legal principle that, like for example, if someone steals your television set and you take it back, I think the the legal ruling you know would be that if you if a reasonable person in your shoes would have been quite certain that that was the television, your television set. It's okay for you to take it back. You, you get what I'm saying? Whereas yeah, yeah. you couldn't just, uh, bomb their house. Well, that too, but also you couldn't take someone else's, like, even if you yeah. diligently got robbed and then someone down the street had a TV model that was similar to yours and you went in and took it and it turned yeah, you out can't just do that. that. No, it looked like it, that you'd be in trouble. And, but again, I think the specific thing would be, you couldn't have been, you know, sure that that was your television set, and there's a high burden of proof that you got to be pretty sure before you do something like that, you know. Um, 
so so I think it would be like that. And likewise, so yeah, if somebody, you know, kills somebody, then yeah, the, the guy's next of kin, I could imagine legally speaking, would have the right to kill him. You know, there's a lot of, you know, tradition in, in, in Western society yeah. and culture about, you know, an eye for an eye. But I think what would happen is, you know, so that would be the, the limit. Like you couldn't kill the guy's kids. It would just be, no, if he, if he's a killer, you can kill him, but also you couldn't like torture him for three weeks that I think it would just be, you know, you can end his right. life. And so that, yeah, if the family did that on their own and it would have to be them, right. It couldn't just be some other person who was out. Like let's say the family is Amish or something and they mm. forgive him. Somebody else couldn't kill the guy and say, well, I'm not letting a, a murderer live in this neighborhood. Other property owners could say, well, you're a, a murderer. Get off my land. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the, the fact that they forgave you, good for them, but you know, get off my property. They could still do that, but yeah. they couldn't, you know, shoot him. They say, Oh, he was a murderer walking around. That's kind of how I think. And so I think yeah. Yeah, in practice, the, the law might say you're allowed to do up to this amount of, you know, retaliation. Right. But in practice, I think what would happen pretty quickly is it would just become standard that, you know, the convicted murderer could say, okay, yeah, you have the right to kill me, but what if I gave you $800,000 instead? And you let me work for the next 20 years paying you that debt off. And then, you know, the family would think about it and say, well, that's not going to bring dad back if we kill him. And, you know, we could do a lot with his money and blah, blah, blah. And, and also I think that's better for the convicted individual, you know what I mean? Like in terms of rehabilitating people, instead of just putting them in a cage, like I know we were talking about death penalty, but short of that, like, oh no, he should be sitting in prison for 20 years. That doesn't help anyone become a better person, right? It doesn't help yeah. anybody. And then he's like mixing it up with other criminals like that's and, and maybe, They're perfecting maybe, the know, art of being the criminal in that, right. in that or, setting, you know, yeah. maybe being himself abused in there from those other, you know, and yeah. so then you let him out after 20 years and they're rampaging maniacs. Right. Right. right? So that's just crazy. And so I yeah. think a much more humane system that also would tend to minimize recidivism would be that no, when you're convicted, technically, yeah, the family or whoever can do this much in punishment to you. But I think in practice, they would just get, you know, a monetary compensation in lieu of that. And I think as that became more widespread, that would just become the civilized thing. So that if somebody ever did yeah. say like, oh, yeah, this guy, you know, in a bar fight broke this guy's arm and this guy broke both of his arms because the judge said that you're allowed to do that. I think most people was like, oh, why did you why didn't you just take three hundred thousand dollars? What's wrong with you? What are you, you know, sick? What's yeah. you twisted? So, yeah, I, I think that's. Kind yeah, it creates an incentive for more civilized behavior, actually. Right. Because or civilized is, responses. Yeah. Because there is a certain, I don't know, paradox is the right word, but like to sit, you know, if, if little kids are growing up and they're like, oh, how come that guy is, you know, is being hanged and say, because he killed someone in this, in this community, we don't like killers. And that's why we killed him. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait a second. And, and ultimately, <laughs> you know, there's some limit to that logic, right? Like if some guy kidnapped a bunch of people and kept him in his basement for 10 years and did awful stuff and then killed him. You're not going to take him and put him in a basement for 10 years and tort. You know what I mean? The most you're going to do is kill him. Yeah. You know, like yeah. most people realize you're not going to literally just do to everybody what they did to their victims. And so once you admit that, well then, okay, just because they killed someone, why does that mean we need to kill him? And again, it doesn't bring anybody, but, but yeah. going back to your question, I do think at least in the initial uh, implementation of this, I think because there is a sizable segment of the population who would, you know, who think that, no, and if somebody kills somebody, you know, either they deserve to die or at the very least the victim's family has the right to claim their life if they so choose, like you leave it up to them. That's not that we should, the community should impose that choice on them. Right. Um, I can imagine that being the the, the legal norm. Right. And presumably this, the, the way this would look, from place to place would differ based on, you know, the values of that community. I mean, a place that was that was full of Amish people. I'm imagining the law and how how it plays out would look a lot different from, you know, uh, an East Coast or a West Coast sort of urban environment. I mean, if there really is no monopoly, then it seems like local values would sort of rise to the top wherever you are, and it's gonna it would look different from place to place. Right. And it's, and precisely because of that, that's why a lot of people recoil from this kind of system that I'm sketching because it seems arbitrary. And that, and that's, I get why like an objectivist gets frustrated with this. Like, no, like what you're describing is like saying, 
uh, you know, in a vegetarian community, the, the restaurants aren't going to serve burgers, but in another place they are, but that's not because there's anything intrinsically moral and moral, but well, if you're a, a, a <laughs> vegan and animal rights person, you would think there would be, but you get what I mean. Yeah. Or like chocolate versus vanilla ice cream. Like, oh yeah, it's just profitability and we're going to cater to what the community wants. But when it comes to matters of justice, there really is an objective right or wrong. And yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm Christian. I do think, you know, there's absolutes, but likewise, having a government doesn't solve that, right? Yeah. So if you've got a hardcore community of, you know, uh, followers of Islam and they think that it's a, a more illegal for a woman to walk, walk around in a bikini, having representative government and a bicameral legislature and, you know, executive, if, if it's 99% hardcore Muslims who think that, well, then in their system, you're going to, the, the government police are going to arrest her and, you know, try yeah. her if, because she's walking around in a bikini. Right. So I'm saying the virtue of uh, a more a voluntary framework, like I'm saying, is it doesn't allow some people to impose their will actually on others or things where it's um, if it's there's really a high cost, at least that will be expressed. Right. So just to give a quick example. So let's say, you know, there's some despised minority. Uh they're much more likely to have their basic rights protected in the kind of framework I'm talking about, even though a lot of people might have thought it would go the other way. They might say, oh, no, in, in, a, in, a, in a system where there's there's no absolutes, it's just profit makes right or something, then you know, the, why wouldn't the 90 percent who despise the other 10 percent, why wouldn't they just you know, patronize legal systems and whatever, and they have more voting power? But by the same token, OK, if it's a majority rule democratic system, you're going to get the same outcome. Right. But the difference is right. the, you know, the 10%, like, like it's very costly. Like it depends how extreme we're talking about, but if it's like, yeah. oh yeah, people, it, it's not illegal to kill. Let's say it's redheads just, you know, to make it not so inflammatory. <laughs> right. To just say, oh yeah, like you can go, it's not illegal to go kill a redhead. Cause they're not, you know, they're not the same thing as, as other people that that would be a very expensive thing. Cause like among other things, redheads would pay a lot, you know, to avoid that outcome. And it would just be very costly, right? Like they work, play, you know, employers hire them and whatever, they're productive members. So I'm saying just killing them and there's no, that imposes a lot of costs on the community or losses, let's say, damages yeah. beyond just to the individual who just got killed. And I'm saying a market system like I'm describing, though that has ramifications. Other people feel that more so than in a society right. where it's just, right. oh, we vote and then that that's what well, the outcome is. And there's also there's also something about this whole idea of imposing a one size fits all solution on an entire nation of people who have different cultures, different values, different beliefs. It's never going to make everyone happy. And I think everyone that just seems so obvious to me. You know, you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to impose these one size fits all rules that's going to make for a happy, harmonious big, big, huge group of people. Um, and yeah, you can believe that, you know, well, my, my view of morality is the right one, or, you know, that this is some objective truth. And I, I think there are objective truths too, but I think the ones we can agree on are things like, you know, murder and theft and that kind of thing. Um, beyond that, you know, there, I think there's something, I think it's always going to just lead to more conflict to try and find one view of, justice or morality that's going to fit everyone because it's not i mean mm -hmm. you know you could take the example of abortion and definitely don't want to go down that right you know trail but it really comes down to it's it's a it's a clash of fundamental values and you're just not going to get in this country especially you're not going to get everybody to be on one side or the other side and to try and impose i feel like to try and impose one view of what the right answer to that is across the country it's just going to result in more conflict and more divisiveness as opposed to having you know different communities where the downside of that is you have to you have to know that you know across the border these people are doing something that that i find morally objectionable um and there are all these other communities all over you know all over the place doing things i find morally objectionable but which is worse living like that or trying to, you know, force everybody into one box. Yeah. And, and what you just said ties into a point that I wanted to make sure we, we got across uh, in this episode that the people 
thinking like again with that objectivist mindset and, and i'm just i keep going back to that because i just recently saw at the soho forum uh it was brian kaplan and uh oh, i'm blanking on the guy's name now but the the head of uh the Ayn Rand Institute. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I can't think of his name either, but I know who you mean. And so, and they were arguing just over this stuff. And so again, they seem to think that right now in the real world with States, we have the rule of law and no, we don't even in the United States, right. some States have the death penalty and other States don't. Yeah. Right. So we don't have a single body of law that's applied equally to all Americans. It depends yeah. which state you're in. And then certainly the laws change if you, leave the US and go into Canada or Mexico. Yeah. Right. And so ultimately to be consistent, the person saying, oh, you need the state to have a monopoly to enforce the rule of law because there's objectives and we don't want to just leave it up to the, the whims of the local population. You would need to have one world government that would impose a uniform law right. code to everyone on earth. Right. And most people don't I mean some people might think that's ideal, but most people think no, it's okay if people across the globe have a different government that they set up. And I recognize even if they use procedures that I think are democratic and blah, 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 the specific, you know, details of their legal code are going to be different from what's over here. And yeah. most people kind of, and they're okay with that. And I'm saying, all right, well, that's what would happen under a voluntary decentralized system. Yeah. No matter which city you went to, whatever ANCAP city you went to murder is going to be illegal. But in some of them, yeah, maybe public nudity is going to be illegal, whereas in other ones, it won't be. You know, I, who knows? Or other ones, yeah. like, yeah, you can't be walking around shooting up heroin on a, on a bench out in the public view and maybe other places you could, whatever. But the, the idea is that, you know, community standards and things, that's all going to find its expression in those uh, codes. I wanted to get back to one thing you were talking about Um the whole idea of insurance coverage is sort of a way of vetting people. And like, if you're, if you don't have good coverage, you know, if you've committed crimes or whatever, you're going to, your insurance coverage isn't going to be great. A hotel's not going to want to take you in. People aren't going to want to do business with you. Mm -hmm. It starts to sound a little bit like a social credit system. So mm -hmm. how do you distinguish between the two? Right. And I'm glad you asked that. And also too, let's try to remember, not forget to come back to the, what if the rich guy just yes. know, pays judges yes. to rule in his favor. Yeah. Um, but, okay. But yes. So you're right. Cause you know, what's what, what I found hilarious. So I wrote this stuff up when I was in grad school. So this was the early to mid two thousands and well, early two thousands. And uh, it was funny that it, the conversation, you know, and I would be arguing this stuff on internet forums and things. And it would typically start out with, Oh yeah, you'd have this completely lawless society where anything goes and there'd be axe murders running around and you know, children just going into the local CVS and getting heroin and blah, blah, blah. And it would just be crazy. Might makes right, and there'd be no rule. And then I would start going through and describing my system. And by the end of it, they'd say, That's a totalitarian nightmare. <laughs> In your framework, to even get into the local mall, you'd have to flash <clears throat> your credentials and show your papers at Checkpoint Charlie just to get in and go, you know, go to the mall. This is what a totalitarian I wouldn't want to live under your unfree society, Murphy, where, you know, corporations <laughs> control micromanage. So I'm just saying, notice those are two completely yeah. opposite objections. Right. Yeah. Um, so having said that though, again, it's going to sound like I'm, you know, trying to say, Oh, my system has the best of everything. Ha ha. But I think, we, yes, we don't want there to be the Chinese system where if you criticize the government, then, you know, you get dinged and then, you know, hotels and stuff won't rent rooms to you and whatever. Or if you, you know, if you uh, don't have enough carbon credits or if you do things that you get dinged, we don't, we don't want that, right. That's totalitarian micromanagement of your day-to-day -day life. And that's, that's creepy. Uh, but on the other hand, again, we don't want wild recklessness. And so like, if you're a lender and you're deciding whether or not to give a loan to somebody, I think most of us are okay that there exists such a thing as a credit score. Right. And it's, it's completely voluntary, right. That you, it's thing, you know, these and agency and there's competition among them and they, but they just keep track of your debts and whatever. And so you, and you could say, I don't want that. And then they could say, okay, fine. Then, but no major credit card is ever going to give you a, you know, a card and no bank's going to give you a loan or whatever, if you've never agreed to, you know, this kind of thing. So I think again, likewise in the, in the system I'm describing, you know, once we stipulate what the basic property rights are, no one's forcing you to do anything, but you could imagine, you know, in certain settings, again, if you're the apartment owner and some random guy shows up and you have no idea who he is, 
like, you know, I think most people, are you okay with if they, if they do a background check just to see, is this guy, you know, from a neighboring community where there's pending, uh, you know, judgments against him that, oh yeah, he just, he robbed a bank 200 kilometers away. And now he came over here and he's trying to rent a room. Well, no, I don't want you renting. You know, so I, I think it's, it's just a matter of competing interests that, yeah, on the one hand, you as an individual don't want a bunch of other people prying into your business and thinking every little thing I do is going to have some impact. But on the other hand, other types of businesses realize we got to protect the people in our organization and we can't let antisocial individuals come in here without some kind of filter on the front end. And I think the, the, the trade-off between those two uh, desires to say, well, what's the right line? I think it depends on a case by case basis. And again, put it into a voluntary competitive framework you're going to get, you know, the outcome that caters to the most people and what their preferences are. So probably like in a small community where everyone kind of knows each other and there's not a lot of, you know, drifters coming and going, you know, maybe when you go to apply for an apartment, they actually wouldn't say, well, you got to have a policy by a reputable insurance company. Cause they would just know we've been running this place for eight years and only once has there ever been an issue. And so we're not going to, annoy most of our customers for some rare thing that's probably not going to even matter you know they could do right stuff right like, just like a, maybe a better more practical example for people is if you've noticed um if you're like in a suburb and you go to buy baby formula in the in the walgreens or something it's up on the shelves but if you're in a rough neighborhood and you go in it's behind yeah. the glass you know what i mean you got to go to the front and ask for it yeah and you know, that's inconvenient or whatever, but you can understand why the store is doing that in a high crime area. And so I think it's a similar kind of thing here where, you know, yeah. businesses would respond appropriately. And if it really isn't an issue, then they wouldn't have those, those screens up or those extra checks, but, you know, in right, certain, right. you know. Well, you'd also think that, you know, if people, if, if your experience of using your insurance as a way to, you know, to vet yourself for, for people you want to do business with, if your experience of that feels like a totalitarian nightmare, you might switch insurance companies or, you, you know, mm -hmm. there's it's in this system, it seems like the, the individuals have a voice. Whereas, you know, in China, you don't have a voice. You don't have, you know, there's no, there's no, um, there's no feedback loop for the people who are being social credited upon um, right. to sort of voice their, their objections. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just to extend what you're saying, uh, Right, because partly what's going on with you know the, the Chinese system and then in the U.S. how they're trying to unveil it, and I think you know like the World Economic Forum and those characters are all involved. It's they're lying, right? It, they're they want to implement it like with the um the Vax ID, yeah, right. <clears throat> they don't they weren't trying to stop the spread of coronavirus. That's not what the point of those was. Yeah, the point was to track people, and they knew, oh yeah, just try to get a national ID card that everyone's got to carry around to get in a plane, whatever. The American public's not going to be for that. So let's do the Vax passport instead, or the Vax port. Was that what they called it? Vax port? Uh, um, Vax so, passport? Yeah, whatever. I think they they had some, I mean, <laughs> not cute. the authorities, like the the libertarians who were against it. Like they, I think they called it Vax port, like just a, but anyway, th th it was all a farce, right? It wasn't about, yeah. and, and I'm not even taking a stand on COVID and the, the effects of it. I'm just saying the authorities were not implementing a lot of those rules and procedures because they were just lying awake at night, like, oh my gosh, grandma's going to catch this. And what can we do to help her? That's not what was going on. No. And so that's partly why people recoil against that stuff is because we know it's phony and they're lying to us and they're unveiling these things or unrolling them for other reasons. Like CBDC is not to prevent fraud. It's to be able to track people and to be able to shut them out of the commerce. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why yeah. they're doing it. And so, yeah, with this stuff, there would be genuine competition. And so, yeah, if, if there were different, you know, like there could be rating agencies, like beyond just a credit score, but just in general, like your law and a law and order score or something, which sounds eerily similar, but at the very least, it would be accurate. It would be classifying stuff that other people would plausibly care about. Yeah. You know what I mean? That like a, yeah. a, a potential employer or whatever, if it's going to say, oh yeah, this guy, and you know, he, um, you know, he, he eats a lot of beef and that has a lot of carbon emissions. Someone who's thinking right. about hiring you to work in their factories and say, I don't care. You know, now yeah. in his previous job, did he get into fist fights all the time? I care about that. And so that, that's the kind of, you know what I mean? So they would, yeah, do things the incentives like line up, the incentives right. line up to produce something right. kind right. of same. And like, yeah. yeah. And like you said, there's also the flip side that the people 
being surveilled or investigated or reported upon, you know, they also would have an interest in privacy. And so those companies would only maintain stuff that, you know, in the interplay between the two, you know, in other words, you might say, Hey, what business of it is yours my credit agency that I got into six fist fights in my last job. And they would say, well, because for our business model, employers are only going to care about our reports. If we include stuff like that, if we didn't, if we didn't include that, we would go out of business and they would cater to reporting agencies that do tell them if you got into fist fights at your last job. So yeah, that's a pretty relevant thing. And then yeah. you as an employee, you might say, well, I'm going to shop around, but if all the major agencies are like, no, <laughs> if you got in a fist fight in your last job, we got to tell the potential employer that then you, you would realize, okay, if I want to work and, now, and you wouldn't need to use that, you could say, okay, well, I Oops, you just froze up. Oh, there you're oh. back. You froze up for okay. a second there. Okay. So, but again, even there, it's not that it's imposed on you. You could just say, okay, fine. Well, you know, screw you guys. I'm going to go find, you know, a sole proprietor and talk to the owner and say, you know, yeah, you know what? I don't have reporting agencies. I did get into a fight in the last job, but you should have heard what the guy, you know, the guy was sleeping with my wife. And the guy was like, oh, dude, really? Okay, yeah, well, I'll give you a shot. If you start a fight here, you're gone. But okay, I'll give you a shot. You get what I'm saying? So yeah, nobody's yeah. being forced. It's just be, different groups have their end. But yeah, no one's going to be maintaining records of things that really have nothing to do with the ostensible purpose just because they're snoops or trying to spy on you because that would go out of business. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's get back to the rich guy who pays the judges to rule in his favor. Right. Okay, so um, what's funny about that objection is, so it's a valid objection, a concern, but what's funny is it seems like the the implication is, because right now when, when we had the state running the court system, there really is a, one rule of law that applies to everybody, and rich people are prosecuted with just as much zeal and vigor as the lowly, you know, poor homeless guy. When, of course, no, everyone knows in the current legal framework, if you're wealthy, you can afford really good lawyers and whatever, and you're going to be able to beat, uh, cases yeah. that, uh, uh, someone without as much, you know, as much means would be prosecuted, you know, would be convicted on. Right. So r right now it, it's not the case that a rich person, um, isn't, uh, able to, to evade the consequences of Ill illegal activity more than a poor person. Right. So it's just, a, as always a matter of degree between yeah. which system do you think, uh, is more susceptible to that. So in a free society, again, the way the judge, again, in the typical case, it's not, and this is another thing I haven't highlighted, the distinction. Right now, if you get charged with a crime and you go before a court, you have no role in who your judge is. That's just assigned, right? Yeah. And so even if that judge has a, a notorious history of corruption and making terrible rulings that the public can kind of see, that's crazy. That What a, what a crazy ruling. You know, if it's a place where the judge is, is due to election, you can try to vote the guy out or something. But, you know, it might be a political appointee. It's a very tenuous, you know, like like the mayor, when, when two people are running for mayor, the fact that one judge in that city's framework made a crazy ruling two years ago, that's not going to determine the outcome of that election. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So everything just gets all bundled together. Whereas, again, in this more decentralized framework that I'm talking about, the way a particular judge maintains his or her livelihood is both parties to the dispute have to submit to it ahead of time and say, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm willing to go before this judge. Are you sure? Yeah. And so if it were, you know, documented that, that, oh yeah, occasionally this judge, whenever there's rich clients tends to rule in their favor, even if we didn't know, we didn't see the paper trail. It just looked like, huh, it seems kind of funny that rich defendants are always get off with this guy. Even when it looks like there was a smoking gun case against them, then, you know, other people, when their plaintiffs against a rich defendant are going to not agree to that judge. Right. And so that's, you know, the, the way it would work that, yeah. yeah, at any given time, certainly people are susceptible to bribery or whatnot, but if your whole, there's a cost to it for them. Right. Right. You're more likely to be punished. Whereas in the current system, again, at best, it means, Oh, that might be something that would anger people. And in the next election, maybe that's going to be used against you, but you know, people aren't going to remember that two years later and that, you know, so anyway, yeah. that's, I think the, the penalties for corruption are much lower in practice in the current system than it would be in the kind of one that I'm describing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a bunch of other sort of, what about, what about one really sort of targeted specific one gets back to, to defense. 
um, because I hear this objection sometimes, which is nuclear weapons exist. You know, we're not going to get rid of them. Isn't it safer for humanity? Isn't it better that they're held by governments, that we have this, this way of limiting who gets them, and there are very strict controls on how they can be used. If we didn't have those governments, the nuclear weapons are still there. Wouldn't anybody have access to them? And how would you, it just seems like that would be a very dangerous thing to have this, this terrible technology available to anyone with no controls on it. How do you respond to that? Okay, sure. So, uh, so one thing is to say, you know, in re in the last 150 years, the biggest mass murderers have been political states. Yeah. Right. So in terms of what's the last group, like I would rather plumbers or electricians or soccer players have control of the nukes rather than politicians ultimately, right. You like in terms of, or you know, let's say political rulers. Cause in some countries like, you know, with Stalin, a politician, I wouldn't yeah. use that word. For him. Um, so there's, there's that, but I, I get, you know, the, the, pr the premise, the idea being, shouldn't there be strict legal limits on who can control these things? And then given that we have a world dominated by states, doesn't that mean that the state should be in control? So the way I would handle that in my framework is, uh, again, going back to you know the basic uh, framework that uh, the way you would interact with other members of society, other institutions, is I think you'd have uh, an insurance company or fraternal organization or whatever it's going to be called vouching for you. And so likewise, if you're some company that wants to, you know, buy a factory and start uh, processing uranium and building really powerful weapons, I think in order for an insurance company to sign off on that, to say, yes, if this company is convicted of causing damages to anyone in the community, you know, we will pay that off and then we'll deal with them ourselves. They're going to have, they're going to have rules in place. Like say, well, no, if you have equipment, on your premises that could possibly kill a million people, then, and then we're going to be on the hook for those legal damages. There's no way we're going to vouch for you. I don't care what you pay us in premiums. That's too risky. And so I think that's the way things like that would, would, would play out that you would see the, the legal. So effectively, uh, I don't think private organizations would be legally allowed to hold bit, you know, super aggressive weapons that if misused could cause widespread carnage. So there might be like tactical nukes that could be used defensively, but in terms of, do we need to have the ability to blow up a whole city? I, I don't think that that would legally happen in the kind of world I'm talking about. It wouldn't about. be insurable. Right. I mean, there was an argument. I remember when, uh, when Fukushima happened and there was an argument at that time that, and I believe it was the case that, that nuclear power, at least that nuclear power station was not insured that it's that it's not insurable because of the because of the um because of exactly what you're talking about the high degree of risk is that do you know if that's the case I, I I know about the U.S. I don't know over there like what their deal was but yeah in the U.S. one of the issues with developing uh, you know building more nuclear plants was apparently with the regulation and the liability and that's why a lot of pro nuclear people wanted you know the 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 legal code to be changed that, that yes, like you're saying, I think a lot of insurers, you know, would, would not put themselves on the hook for that because, you know, geez, if something goes wrong, there's a potentially open-ended liability. And so they wanted, uh, you know, the pro nuclear people wanted government rules, kind of like with the vaccine stuff. Yeah. Like to say, hey, yeah. Don't hold us accountable know, for the harm we, we do. Have, so, so right. So it's, um, now I can't speak to, like I've talked to some pro nuclear people that that uh, agree with the limits, but they say no, it's common sense things. Like if you knew enough about the science and blah blah, blah you'd see that you know what we're talking about is is quite reasonable. And it's more like just not giving the jury the ability to say, oh, that's a trillion dollars in damages when really it's not. You know that right, kind of thing. Right. So I don't know enough to to weigh in on whether it's yeah. right or wrong. I'm just saying in the free society that I'm talking about, the legal damage, you know, liability would be sensible. And if it turned, and I think in practice that, yeah, the, so whereas a nuclear power facility, if it's got safeguards and whatever, poses a, not a very big threat yeah. to the population. Yeah. Whereas if you have a bunch of things that have, oh, Jesus, some group broke in, or if just the people running this organization went rogue and they wanted to, they could kill millions of people. 
that, yeah, I don't think any third party would want to say, yep, we vouch for them and we're on the hook legally for any damage they cause. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One of the biggest objections I hear all the time is this has never been tried historically. There are no historic examples of anything like what you're talking about. So this is crazy. It, can, it never has been. It never can be. How do you address that? Okay. So if I want to be glib about it, I can say, uh, well, good. So this way, at least we know it's not a demonstrated failure. In contrast, your proposal, typically the person I'm talking to, yeah. of limited constitutional government, we know that doesn't work because, we, you know, look at who we had. We had Samuel Adams and Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, and they all got together and gave us this great system, this great experiment, and it blew up in our face. So you really think we're going to reboot and have a bunch of founding fathers that are better than those guys were to give us Constitution 2.0 and this time we mean it? Right. So I'm going to say, if you're going to use lessons of history, you can say limited government clearly does not work. It's been tried hundreds of times. It always has failed, always 100 percent failure rate. And so, you know, I could again, being glib, I could say at the very least the system I'm saying, it's not that there was some society that we could point to that. Oh, yeah, that was doing what Murphy wanted. And then 50 years later, it, it it's a big state that took over or something. Um, so less glibly. It's true. No one society has ever had all of the attributes I'm talking about, but each particular thing I'm saying, you, there are analogies, just like in this conversation we've been having, you know, I would try to say like with the medical malpractice, right? Like it really is the case right now that for you to drive your car, you need to get insurance uh, that, you know, vouches for you and says, yep, if this guy causes damage with his vehicle, we will make the person good. good. And otherwise you can't drive on the road. So I think, you know, that's just a standard thing to say in a free society, it would be similar. The owner of the road we would say you need to have a policy, you know. So a lot of these things are are like that. Um, and again, with arbitration, you know, you see that right now. There's private security in terms of you know personnel. I think there's more people employed privately in security right now in the U.S. than there are public sector police forces. Okay, wow. so their their legal standing is different. But I'm just showing it's not that everyone just sits back and says, "Oh, we have the police to protect us." that no, lots of organizations know the way you actually protect your person and property and your employees and stuff is you have private sector employees, you know, with that function. It's just, they're not government police. So, um, you know, again, with all these things, the ratings agencies, like things with Amazon and stuff, like I think that shows a real world application of, well, gee, what if you send money to someone and they don't send you your books or your merchandise well, that could happen, but they have rating systems. And in practice, it's pretty good. Whereas if I told you how Amazon.com worked before it was a thing, you could imagine a lot of people saying, that would never work. Are you out of your mind? You're just going to send money to random people 200 miles away and just hope they send you their stuff. That's not going to work. And yet it does work, right? So I, yeah. I, I realize a lot of this stuff, if I say the whole system at once, sounds crazy. But if you just think of each little component of it, it's not crazy. And we do see real world analogs of that already. And I'm just kind of combining it all into one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Why do people tell anarcho-capitalists to go move to Somalia? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a very popular thing. So Somalia per se, I don't think is so unfair. And I'll come back to that in a second, but in general, yeah, people will point to like recently I saw someone say, Oh, if you like free markets, go to Gaza right now because there there's no government in it. And I, and I, and again, my point was, yeah, a, a region being completely obliterated by a government right now is showing, this is what it looks like if there's no government involvement. Like that's just crazy. Yeah. Um, so with Somalia, in fairness to there, it really was uh, a genuine period of statelessness. Uh, you know, when the, I forget the guy's name, when the you know previous dictator fell and then, you know, there were squabbling clans and things, but there was no other government that was established in, in his uh, absence. And so it was genuine statelessness. So it wasn't a picnic, but you know what? Somalia under anarchy was better than Somalia with a state. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so again, with all these things, you got to do apples to apples. By, that, by what measurements? Uh, life expectancy, literacy rates. Oh. Uh, one that maybe doesn't strike people as particularly important, but like cell phone usage per capita, you know, yeah. various metrics that, um, and also too, 
Uh, so Ben Powell has has an article on this. If if you want to look that up and put it in the show notes page, yeah, it's P O P O W E L L is how you spell his last name. Um, and also too, he did it uh, like a like a comparison of Somalia with some of its of the neighboring countries, and just yeah. showed over time. And so it's not only that in absolute terms Somalia did better when their government fell, because you might just say, oh well, in general humanity progresses or whatever, but no, that the rate of improvement, like Somalia compared to its neighbors, Somalia's relative standing improved when their government fell. And, and why did their government fell? It's not because everyone read Rothbard. It's because mm. the guy was so corrupt and it was such an awful regime that it collapsed under its own weight. Okay. So it's not surprising that taking away that awful parasitical regime and leaving it with nothing, those people did better off. Right. And so, so again, but it's, to point that say, oh, see, that's what happens. You take away the government. It's like, no. So, well, again, so for one thing is, yep, they were better. So even so, Somalia does live up to the to the claim, which is take a given group of people, other things equal. You take away their state, they're going to be better off. Somalia actually fulfills that. Now that again, the claim is not for any group of people with a state compared to any other group of people without a state. The latter's better. That's not what we're saying, right? Right. Um, and so it's like if I say. Uh, it's good for a basketball team to pass the ball around and not just have one guy, you know, take all the shots. And you could say, Oh, so uh, the Chicago bulls with Michael Jordan, if he just took the shots all the time, isn't going to be able to beat a high school team. If they pass the ball a lot, well, no, the bulls would win, but I'm saying other things equal, right? So the Chicago bulls, right. if they pass more is better than the Chicago bulls. If Jordan just shoots every shot. Right. And so likewise, yeah, the U S if you take their state away, we're going to be way more productive and better and peaceful than Samaya without a state. Okay. So that's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's apples to oranges. Um, really quickly, because I realized how, how, how much, how much, how little time we have left. Um, if you can quickly address the issue of how do you prevent a new monopoly state from rising up? Okay. So I, I can't guarantee that, right? You know, human, yeah. humans have free will. There's nothing that would necessarily prevent you from forming a state, you know, depending on your view of history, whether you believe in the literal Genesis account or whether you believe in more of an evolutionary thing. At some point, there wasn't what we think of as human government or states, let's say, because government could be a more generic term, yeah. but political states of the kind we mean, those definitely started at some point in human history, right? And so if there was a period when humans existed and they didn't have the political course of state that we have in mind by that term, and then later it existed, clearly that shows states can come into existence, right? And so I can't prevent that and say, oh, because of clause eight on my contracts, well, what if people just ignore them, right? So I can't prevent that. But what I can say is, um, I think if you had a system like I'm talking about up and running, it would be very robust to the emergence of a new state. And so I think what's what's really crazy is to start with a limited state and assume it's going to stay limited, right? Because there it's yeah. very easy, especially when the state is in charge. Oh, we have a Supreme Court. And mm -hmm. so when we're accused of violating our prerogatives, we turn to the justices we appointed and said, hey, did we break the law? And they say, no, you didn't. OK, good. Great. I'm glad we got that straightened out. Yeah. And, you know, we, we took away these people's guns. Does that violate the Second Amendment? No, it doesn't. OK, phew. OK, great. Right. Yeah. That's what's ludicrous. Whereas if you don't have that apparatus and it's all competing organizations with a general decentralized rule of law where nobody's above the law, it's hard for one organization to kind of rise and dominate the others. Um, and, you know, to kind of go back to like say, oh, well, wouldn't the dominant defense agency just turn into the state? They could try, but everybody would at least recognize that they were criminals. That's I mean, the, the state right now. Mm -hmm. It's not merely that they have guns and they point it. And I think a lot of libertarian types miss this sometimes, that they're real jaded. And they say, oh, yeah, the reason the government can do X, Y, Z is because they have more guns than people. No, the, they have legitimacy. Now, you might think it's misplaced, and so do I, but the general public does not view the mayor's office as the same thing as like a mob boss headquarters, right? right? That right. certain libertarians do, but <clears throat> that's not the general population. If the general population yeah. thought that, the mayor would, wouldn't be a a ruler anymore. He would lose his authority. Yeah. And yeah. so um, I think people underestimate that, that in order for a group to rise above and then, you know, they would have to gain some legitimacy and it would be hard to go from a situation of 
anarcho-capitalism to one group coming on and, and taking over all those powers that we traditionally associate with a nation state and not having anybody along the way say, wait a minute, you guys are violating your prerogatives. You can't do that. You're a criminal. Right. Right. Yeah. Especially if you've got, if you've got this established rule of law where, where everyone is held accountable and suddenly someone rises up and, and is like, well, no, we're not going to, we're not, we don't want to be held accountable. We're, we're you know, mm -hmm. we're going to do our own thing. It's like, I think people just based on their own experience would have a problem with that. I would, right. I would hope, I would think. And, and also just to elaborate or extend what you said, I think the fact that there would be competing agencies providing the same type of service would be critical. So yeah. right now, you go to a restaurant, you go to a fast food place and you get food poisoning. People can be mad at that chain and say, Hey, watch out community. Don't go to you know Burger King because I got a Whopper the other day and I got real sick and da da da. They wouldn't say, Oh, well, next time you're hungry, I guess you're just going to stay home then. You know what I mean? Like they wouldn't talk like that yeah. because there's other competing places. Yeah. Whereas if people say, hey, you know, the cops last week, they took that cu that suspect into custody and they broke his arms. I don't think they should have done that. You'll get a lot of people saying, oh, well, next time someone's breaking into your house, I guess you're just going to deal with it yourself and not call the cops, right? Right. And, and the right. reason they think like that, that dichotomy, it's all or nothing, is because there's one agency, the police, that do that. If, but if there were right. 10 different police organizations providing those services and one of them was consistently more aggressive than the other nine – it would make sense to say, hey, instead of patronizing this 10th one, let's do these other nine. And it wouldn't be you're either choosing between having laws enforced at all or cops who you know break your arm just because you mouth off to them. Yeah. 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 Do you have any thoughts on Javier Millet and whether he's really, is he a real anarcho-capitalist? Is he, are you hopeful? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm biased because in an interview, he literally cited chaos theory. Oh, wow. Somebody was asking him, from my point of view, he was like, Robert Murphy, chaos theory. But so I don't know what he said, but I think it was, it was uh, favorable. And um, so, yeah, I mean, he is, he really does know an anarcho capital. He's not just bluffing. And again, why would you bluff in this? Right. <laughs> right. Although he won. So I guess you could say maybe he did realize that, no, the time is right. What yeah. the people want is That's an anarcho capitalist. What a gamble, I think. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm going to pretend to be it, even though actually I'm a minarchist. Um, yeah. So I do think that, yeah, he actually is an ANCAP and he, you know, he's a trained economist that like, people don't know his background. He's a professional economist. He's worked for major banks and stuff. So okay. he's definitely, you know, in that vein and has read the literature and, and knows the theory and, and believes in it. Um, so I don't know. I, like, I don't know him personally. I know a lot of people who are close you know, to him, like I interviewed uh, uh, this guy, Nicholas Kachanowski, who was one of the co-authors of the proposal to uh, to get rid of their central bank and to dollarize. Um, so I know a lot of people that are, you know, like I'm like one or two layers of separation from him. And a lot of them are very uh, complimentary and they're hopeful that they, that, you know, so like when the people on the left are accusing him now of being a fascist and whatever, because he's, uh, like saying, oh, if you're protesting and blocking traffic, we're going to arrest you. And so like the left say, oh, look at this, so he's right wing fascist. And I know a lot of people who are you know coming out and defending him. And so I don't know him personally. I haven't followed his career or anything, but I definitely can say he's, he knows the material. He's not bluffing about that. And um, a lot of people who I respect are hopeful. Like, let's see if this guy can really pull this off. They don't think it was like some cynical thing. And oh yeah, he's going to get in there and disappoint us just like everybody else does. Yeah, he did say he was going to get rid of the central bank, and I think people people had had the sense that that was going to happen like on day one, and it hasn't happened yet. And right, what do you what do you think about that? Do you, do you think he's broken his word on that? Um, so I I don't know. Uh, I I agree with you. Like he was you know having a chainsaw and stuff like that. And yeah, so it seemed pretty bombastic. Having said that, though, he did publicly endorse the dollarization plan. Like I said, this guy I know uh, Nicholas, and I forget what his co author's name was. Um, in, in their proposal, like it was written, you know, a few years ago. So it was before Javier was, was a thing, um, or a front runner, at least, you know, it, it was a, a laborious process. It wasn't just on, you know, next Thursday, we get rid of the central bank because the deal yeah. was all of the existing banks, all of their, um, a assets like on reserve with the, with the central bank were denominated in their local currency. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you can't just snap yeah. your fingers yeah. and switch the whole thing over. Just like right now, imagine if 
um, you know, we were going to get rid of the Federal Reserve and instead of everybody using dollars, we were going to use uh, Swiss francs or something. That would be hard to pull off in one month, like yeah. that transition yeah. without disrupt. So th that's what the what the feedback I've gotten on that. So again, I don't know, did was his campaign rhetoric, did he leave that open to nuance or like, did he lead his supporters to believe, no, we're really going to on day one, get rid of that thing. I don't, I don't know. Cause I'm, I don't speak yeah. the language and I, you know, I haven't been able to see what those commercials were like. But, but it sounds like that wouldn't have been a realistic thing to promise anyway. You well, know, right. And, and what gonna... I can say is, yeah, that he publicly endorsed this plan for this is the blueprint we're going to use for the dollarization. And if you went and read that, it, it was clear this was going to be a drawn out process. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. 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 Okay. We've gone close to two hours now. <laughs> um, is there anything, I mean, we could probably go on and on and on, but is there anything else, is there anything critical we've left out? Anything that, you know, big misunderstandings people have, something, anything that needs to be addressed? Well, it's a fun, can we talk about the mafia? Like when the yeah, mafia yeah, just yeah. took over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, a good one. Like I think that just kind of underscores how if you study free market economics, you have a certain insight into this. So right now, and again, I'll use the U.S. as the, um, the, the, place where I'll, I'll make my, my points and reference to since that's the history I know. But in the United States, what are the sectors where the mafia or organized crime in general thrives? It's all those that are either literally prohibited or heavily regulated by the state. Right? Yeah. So prostitution, gambling, uh, illegal narcotics. And back in the 20s when alcohol was illegal, right? that's what organ, you know, Al Capone was a bootlegger and all that stuff, right? Once you, they legalized alcohol, it's not that organized crime had anything to do with liquor anymore. Okay. And so as an economist, yeah. you can study that and try to figure out why that is and then go through and say, well, yeah, because when it's illegal, there's market share and you know, there's incentive to uh, like the costs and benefits of taking out your competitor because this is my area where I'm going to sell the whiskey in this region. Those, those numbers, the incentives are different if it's illegal and the only people selling the whiskey are by definition criminals. Right. Who, to be able to stay in business must have networks in place where they pay off the cops and pay off the judges. Like if the community knows, Oh yeah, you need liquor. You go to that guy. Well, the cops know that too. So the only reason you're going to be able to persist in there is if you're paying them off. Right. 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 And so, you know, right. So you've already, you've already paid sort of the entry fee to the mm -hmm. world of criminality. And so you might as well, you know, be committing crimes. Right. On the margin. Real crimes. You're, yeah. On the margin for you then to occasionally shoot people is not that qualitatively different because you already going to have the police and the judges on your payroll and whatever. Yeah. Whereas if you're a law abiding uh, CEO, uh, you know, Anheuser Busch and you're at a board meeting and they're like, okay, we're going to unveil a new product line and whatever. And let's make sure we don't have you know, commercials involving trans people. Cause that pisses people off apparently. And did a, Oh, and by the way, why don't we go do a drive by and kill the shareholders of Heineken? Maybe that will be good. It'll be like, what are you out of your <laughs> mind? Why would we do that? You, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're running a reputable business here. That would expose us to all kinds of risk. So, and also the margins are smaller, right? When it's a reputable legal business, the markup from what you pay wholesale to get the product and then resell it, right. the markup's not that big. So to capture 2% more market share doesn't mean that much. It's not worth killing somebody over. Whereas yeah. Yeah. You know, to have the rights to sell cocaine in this neighborhood based on what I pay the Colombian drug lords for the product. And then what I resell it for, you know, you're mostly getting paid for the, for the risk of being that, you know, middleman, that's what you're getting compensated for. And so, yeah, yeah. to take somebody out might mean you make an extra $300,000 a month. And yeah, I'd kill somebody for that. I mean, not me, but a person <laughs> could. Right, right. Right. So I'm just saying there's the, so just more generally, that's kind of the idea. And so it's precisely in those areas where the state comes in, in outlaws or heavily regulates quote legitimate business people from operating in yeah. that the mafia thrive. Right. Cause and they, so, because this, the regulation creates those profit margins, right. They wouldn't exist without, right. without that. And so then it, one way of thinking about an anarcho capitalist world, if you want, it's like if the state is still there, but legalized everything. And so <laughs> some people think, uh Oh, if everything's legal, that means mafia is going to run everything. And I would say, no, that means the mafia would run nothing. Right. Right. Go now, out of business. It, yeah, at the current level with the state regulating some things and legalizing others, the state thri or sorry, the mafia thrives in those sectors that are heavily regulated, not in the things that are wide open. The, the mafia doesn't run dry cleaning operations because there's no margin there. 
you know, people really need to have dry cleaners just like they really like to drink, but if there's no, you know, th- yeah. so anyway, that's, yeah. that's no, that's I a really say. good point. That's a really good, that's a really good point. Um, okay. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Um, and I will, I've got a bunch of stuff to link to. I'll link to your, uh, chaos theory and, uh, oh, what is your website? How do people, how do people keep current with you? How do they know where, what you're doing? Uh, I guess I would point people to my podcast probably. So Bob okay. is the place okay. to go. I do have a, a personal site, but I won't even mention it because I haven't updated that in a while. So okay. I would just okay. say Bob Murphy show.com. If you're into the kind of stuff I've been talking about, this is, that's the place to go. Okay. And you're on Twitter. And I don't think you're not on Substack or anything else, right? You're just, um, right. Twitter. I'm Bob Murphy econ. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. Well, thank you.